Bibles, uh, First Peter chapter 5. We're going to uh, conclude our study of First Peter this morning. Um, I, I did want to tell you a story I heard about a, um, a department store. There were three uh, ladies, or uh, they were single uh, ladies, and they were traveling uh, on a, you know, kind of on a girl's, uh, you know, trip. And um, they, they came into a city, and, and they saw a department store, and um, on, the, on the, the window, there was a sign that says, find your man here. That's what it said, find your man here. And so see, these individuals, these, these uh, single ladies, went into the store, and they found a good-looking security guard, and the security guard said, that's right, you're here, and uh, we have five floors. And now, uh, ladies, I want you to understand that uh, you can go up all five floors, but you, you can only choose a man if you go up. So uh, if, if you go from the first or second floor, you, you have to choose a man from the second floor. You can't, you can't come back down and choose. And they said, well, that sounds fair to us. Let's do it. And so they went up to the first floor, and there, were, there was a sign outside, you know, the, the entrance to the, uh, the, to the uh, first floor, or the, the first floor they went up to, and it said, all the men here are um, plain but kind. Plain but kind. Um, they, well, we don't want that. Let's go up to the next floor. And they got up to the next floor. All the men on this floor in this room are handsome but poor. They said, well, we don't want that. Um, so they went to the next floor. All, all the men here are smart but they're unattractive. So they go up to the next floor. The flat, with the, the, you know, the floor, and they got one more after that. The, the, first, the fourth floor. All the men here are handsome, rich, and kind. And then they looked at each other, and they said, well, let, let's not stop. Let, let's go up to the fifth floor, and let's, let's get our men there. So they went up to the fifth floor, and... Um, there, there, there was a sign that said, um, this floor was added just to show that you can't please a woman. <laughs> I'll, I'll have something, um, ladies, for, for men next week. Now, uh, just just equal time, okay? We'll, we'll get equal time. So, anyway, just, just to help. Now, you know, sometimes when we come to the end of a, a chapter... Or, or, or the end of a book, we, we kind of, you know, we kind of ready to move on, you know, because we kind of think, well, gosh, you know, it, it's at the very end. What what could it be, right? I mean, it's kind of like the credits on a movie. This, I, I guess some people stay and watch the credits, when you know, but after the movie's over. I, I never do, but some, I guess some people do. But what, what about it? What, what about the last chapter um, and, and the last verses of the last chapter of First Peter? First Peter had been, had been written. We, we've seen a lot from First Peter, a lot of, you know, theology about Christ and a lot of how to handle persecution, suffering when it comes. We, we saw a lot about relationships and how to build relationships. And we, we saw how to build marriages but, and, you know, the relationship between husband and wife. We, we saw how to handle anxiety, you know. We, we looked and we saw last week how to handle temptation, that, that we don't have to yield to temptation. We don't have to give up. Um, and this week, I want us to look and, and I want us to see just kind of the how, how these last verses um, continue the message of hope. Um, and, 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 and there's always hope. For, and what I've entitled is simply hope for duration. And let me let me read it to you. L- listen to what Peter says in, the, in these um, three verses. By, by Sylvanius, a faithful brother. As I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Because all of you are peace to all of you who are in Christ. Now, we, we, you know, we can kind of skip this, if we, you know, and kind of move on if we, if we choose to, or, or we can kind of say, whoa, 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 what, what is Peter saying? And I think Peter has, or at least I 
look at the verses because they're all important. And if we'll stop and kind of pause, what what is he saying to us? Well, you know, the first thing he mentions to us is Sylvanus. And and what does he call? He calls him a faithful brother. And that's how I regard him, faithful. Now, you say, well, wait a minute. Who who is so Sylvanus? Is this the only time he's he's mentioned in the Bible? I mean, we all know about Peter. We all know about Paul, Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. But Sylvanus, really? But Sylvanus is mentioned in the book of Acts. In, in, in Acts chapter 15, give me a little background here. In Acts chapter 15, the, the church was on the verge of a split, really. I mean, th- there were some individuals in the early church in Jerusalem, and the center of the early church was, was Jerusalem. Remember, they had the day of Pentecost, and the church grew and, and grew by thousands. And, and there were some in the early church who, who believed that in order to be a Christian, you had to become a Jew. You had to undergo the right of circumcision, and you had to keep the feast days and the law. And you, you had to it's kind of complete a Jew and, and, and Jesus, by the way. But, but there were others who, who came from a Gentile or non-Jewish background who said, Well, I thought it was just Jesus. I thought you weren't saved by works. But, and, and so you had these two individuals and these two factions that, that were building. And um, th- th- they were at Jerusalem, and, and the church met. And in Acts chapter 15, at what we call the first council, or the Jerusalem council, uh, you, you had kind of Peter on the one side and Paul on the other side. And, and there was an individual, and his name was James. And James says, men. I, I have a word on this that it's not either or, but it's both and. And 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 we read a description of, of what took place, and, and we read about in Acts chapter 15 uh, about the Jerusalem Council. And I want you to I want you to listen to what it says, and I'll get it to you on the screen. And the, the assembly, um l- look at what it says now. In verse um, 15, um, 22. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas called uh, Barabbas and Silas, leading men among the brothers. And most biblical scholars believe that the shortened version of Sylvanus was Silas. Silas is the one who went and delivered the letter of the news. And we turn over in Acts chapter 15, and remember it was Silas who was with Paul in the jail, in prison because of their faith. And what do we find Silas doing? In, in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, uh, the Bible tells us that um, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. So they, they were in jail, and what were they doing? They, they, were, they weren't griping. They, they, were, they were praising God and singing hymns, and, and the prisoners listened to them. In fact, we go on and read the jailer from Philippi was so attracted to them. And when the earthquake came to open the door, he knew that something miraculous was going on and said, what can I do to be saved? Of course, he heard the gospel message. and The Bible says that he was saved. He and his household that day. That, that, that's Silas. Faithful brother. That's what I mean. That's what Peter called him. Well, hey, can I ask you a question? What, what do people say about you? Or what, what's going to be in our grave when we pass? Well, what's God going to say to us when we stand before Him in heaven? Well done, good and faithful servant. 
you, you're a faithful brother. You're, you're, you're an encourager. You're, you're strong in the faith. You're, you're a leading man in the church or woman. See, sometimes we just skip over that because we're not familiar with it. Or we don't recognize it. When we look at it, there's so much there. But, you know, there's another individual mentioned. His name is, well, the Bible says Peter just calls him Mark, my son. But, again, most biblical scholars believe that this is a Mark. But his name wasn't Mark. His name was John Mark. And, and we read about him in the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 15, John Mark had gone on a missionary journey, the first missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas. And, and you know what happened? I think Mark got homesick and deserted them. And uh, just said, guys, look, I didn't sign up for this. I, I didn't bargain for this. This is too much for me. And, and then, apparently, he came back. And he wanted to continue with them. And here was Paul and Barnabas, and the Bible tells us that a, a disagreement arose between them. Think about that. A disagreement between these two pillars. Paul, well, we're not going to take him with us. He's a wimp. He left us once. What's to say he's not going to do it again? And Barnabas said, well, let's give him a second chance. And, and you know what happened? The Bible said they went their separate ways. Paul left. And Silas, I mean, Barnabas left. Guess what? The Bible says Barnabas took John Mark with him. John Mark. Now, Paul might have given up on him, but if we read the book of Philemon, when Paul wrote Philemon, a wealthy individual in the early church, about Onesimus, a runaway slave, in Philippians, or Philemon 24, guess what? Paul commended John Mark. He's useful to me, Paul said. And most biblical scholars believe that John Mark was in Rome with Peter. And uh, listen to what Peter had to say. And in, in fact, the gospel of Mark, the, there are four gospels. Matthew was a tax script, remember? Luke? Luke, well, well he, he was from a Gentile background, but um, he, he wrote the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And there was John, who was called the beloved disciple. Then there was Mark, and who is Mark? Well, most, again, believe this was the Mark who wrote Peter's account. Uh, Jesus. We, don't, we don't have a gospel of Peter in the Bible. I don't have one in mine. Do you have one in yours? Hey, let me tell you something. People grow up and people change. Do you know that? You know, God's the kind of God that doesn't give up on any of us. And, and uh, you know what? God didn't give up on John Mark. And Peter had such affection for him, he called him my son. Um, you know what? He was just a, a pillar in the early church. Just one of those individuals that made a difference in people's lives. Now, Peter. Remember, Peter wrote this epistle, and he, he did it for several reasons, but one of the reasons he wrote it was to exhort and, and to um, kind of declare what Jesus had done. A faithful brother, he, see, he writes, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of Jesus Christ. I mean, look, Peter wrote these Jewish believers who were struggling, who were out in Asia Minor. And, and they were being persecuted because of their faith. And we, we've seen that. But Peter wrote them to exhort them and to declare to them, look, this is what Jesus did. This is who he was. Don't, don't give up. Don't, don't walk away. Stand firm. And, and we'll look at the stand firm in just a moment. 
Now look, folks, as Christians, as believers, our hope is not built on something that happened or might happen in the future. Our hope is built on what Jesus did when he died on the cross. See, our hope is a fact of history. Our hope is based on a cross, an empty tomb, and a resurrected Christ. Our hope is not what might happen. Our hope is built on what did happen. Peter is writing and says, look, because of this, act like this. Because of this, live like that. In light of what I just said, I'm going to say this. And it's amazing. You see, it's all about Jesus and what Jesus did. And, and Peter just continues that theme throughout his epistles. You see, Peter exhorted them and declared to them that the true grace of God. Now, let's talk about grace for just a moment. Grace is God's gift to you and to me. The, the fact of the word grace comes from the Greek word keros, and it means gift. Grace is God's gift to you and to me. And Peter, in this context, is talking about grace, but, but he doesn't talk just talk about grace. <clears throat> look, you understand, look, we, we are to receive God's grace, and we receive that in Jesus Christ, but we're to grow in grace. We're, we're to be sustained by his grace by, or by his presence. God never leaves us alone. That's grace. People in, in the world around us sometimes are hard. And <coughs> but, you know, eye for an eye. But we receive nothing or hear nothing. Grace. Are people getting what they don't deserve? We, 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 we like it when people get what they do deserve. Listen to what he says. And, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, in verse 10, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you because of grace. You see, folks, grace is not something we experience one time in our life. <laughs> grace is something and there for us every day of our lives if, if we want it. If we just ask God for us, you see, we, we need to learn the word. If we don't use the word already, there's saving grace, but there's also sustaining grace. And it's a sustaining grace, I can assure you of this, that we're going to use every day. The, the saving grace, I, I look, I received that back in 1973. I, I did. And, and years later, I, I can tell you this, I know my saving grace. But it's his sustaining grace that enables Mark to stand faithful. It's, it's his sustaining grace that enables me to kind of face whatever uncertainties out there. A COVID virus, the, the death of my wife, recovery from an accident. I had nothing to do with it. I was doing all the right stuff. And some teenager in a minivan just kind of crossed the center lane. Killed her, put me in the hospital. Just started physical. Look, I wish I could tell Folks, that was a gift that keeps on giving. I'll tell you that. I just started this week physical therapy. I've got arthritis in my hips that I really shouldn't have. Why do I have it? Well, I was in a car wreck. Had major surgeries on my hip. Anyway, another story. But I've got it. So. And, and Peter writes the individuals to remind them of God's. And any time, look, any time we read a passage like this, or any time we, we need to be reminded of God's grace for us. It wasn't just for them; it was for us, and it's for all of us. And let me say this too, folks: it's it's one thing for us to receive God's grace. It's one thing for us today to live by grace. But, but it's something else as Christians for us to allow others to live by grace, right? You see, sometimes we want to limit God's grace, don't we? If that person doesn't live exactly like I live or believe exactly like 
I believe. I, I don't give them the same grace God gives me. Well, I don't think they deserve it. Can I tell you this? The two most frequently asked questions in heaven, you know what they are? Where is so-and-so, and how did you get here? Those are the two most frequently asked questions. <laughs> it's an old joke. Where is so-and-so? How did you get here? Folks, just because someone says something doesn't mean they don't need the same grace that, that I've received. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And Peter writes, and he tells them, and look at what he says. He says, stand firm. St declaring this. He, he writes them, exhorting you and declaring you, this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Stand firm. To stand. Don't, don't be moved. Put your feet down. Don't, don't be blown away by the winds that our culture brings us. Stand firm. Don't, don't be moved. Don't be surprised. Don't be shocked. Now, there's a passage that I didn't, where he says, greet each other with the kiss of love. Can I tell you something? I love this verse in college, it's especially in Bible studies when, when there were girls around before I was married. <laughs> greet each other with a kiss of love. And I, I pull out that verse. I said, do you want to practice this now? I, said, I never did that. But, folks, greeting each other with a holy kiss or with the kiss of love what was the practice in the early church. Do you know that? It, it was. But, but it was, you know, it kind of stopped. It, it, people grew out of it. You know, another place in the Bible it says, you know, greet each other with the right hand of fellowship. We, we do that, or we used to. Now we, you know, pump this or whatever because of, of the code crisis. But folks, it, it was the expression of love that for the commonality that they shared. We, we greet each other with the right hand of fellowship because it's an expression of the oneness that we have in Christ. It's, it's receiving and being willing to give back and forth. It's, it's the result of reciprocal relationship. Now look, Peter also reminds them that they are God's co-elect. Look at what he says. Um, she who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. Well, what was Babylon? Now remember, in, in the Old Testament, the Israelites were carried off into captivity. The northern kingdom was carried off into captivity to Assyria, right? The southern kingdom, two tribes, they, they were carried off into captivity of Babylon. And Babylon came in, in the Jewish mindset to symbolize evil. And Rome was also referred to by some as Babylon. So you see, Rome was symbolic of, of everything that was against God, or at least it was at certain times in history. Rome was symbolized by evil. But, but even in the midst of evil, Peter writes that there are co-elect here in Babylon. Those in Babylon send you greetings. There, there are chosen here in Babylon. Just like you were chosen, they were chosen. Now, why does he do this? I think he does it to let them know they're not by themselves. I, I think he does it to let them know and to remind them that the kingdom of God is vast. You remember Paul in one of his epistles wrote, and those in Caesar's household send their greetings also. Look, the kingdom of God, God's choosing it's far bigger than any of us. Elijah, remember Elijah prayed to die and said, God, I'm the only one. And, and God said, Elijah, you're not the only one. In fact, I've got 3,000 over here. You just don't know about him yet. Remember that? Folks, God, God is working. God is moving. I remember years and years ago, I, I went to Romania. And it was amazing in Romania on the mission trip. The story after story they told about how when the Iron Curtain fell, the church was there. And you know what the church did? The church kind of exploded. 
All, all the seeds were there. God, God was already moving in Romania and in other parts of Eastern Europe, and the church exploded. They were co-elect even in Eastern Europe. And, and you know what? God is still moving today in communist countries, in, in countries that we would say are evil. God, God's still moving because God is not, God, you know, God is not subject to iron curtains and walls and laws and suppression and governments. God is at work. And, and you know what? I think part of Peter, he's simply reminding the individuals, look, you're not in this alone. God, God is working, and, and God's going to continue to work through you and in you if you let. And you know what, folks, today? It's the same thing. God works in us so that he can work through us. We're, we're not in this alone. We have brothers and sisters all around the world. You know what I found out when I was in the hospital with all my injuries? I had people praying for me from all over the world. I had no idea. But they did. Did they know me? No. But God did. And, and they knew I was one of them. And they knew we had a relationship as brothers and sisters in Christ that transcended any human relationship. And will continue for all eternity. You know, those thoughts and, and those ideas are contained in these two verses. Let's not skip them. Let's, let's take them and let's apply them. And let's make sure they make a difference in our life. God's grace that saves us and God's grace that sustains us every day. Have you experienced God's grace are you one of God's elect? Are you, are you one of his chosen? If you need his strength, we'll, we'll pray for you. There's a church right here. To let you know that you're not in this alone. You want to be part of a church family? We're here. We're for you. I, I tell you what, let's talk. Let's pray to God. Father, thank you for your word. 